You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 188, ETS Conference Interviews, part two. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Pretty good. We're still here. We're still... We're still here in, in Rhode, Rhode Island. Island. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> uh, yep, haven't moved anywhere. No? Yeah. Well, part two, uh, we're going to f- have a discussion with uh, two longtime friends of mine, Ron Johnson. Again, uh, he his name will be familiar to people who follow the website, the blog, and Carl Sanders. Uh, we interviewed Carl last year. And you know, we'll actually pick up a little bit with one thought. Uh, from one of our interviews in part one. But, you know, I also want to get into just some fun stuff, kind of, you know, give people sort of an example of what what Bible geeks do when they're together with the kind of things they talk about and the way they talk about things. So I think this will be uh, both interesting and entertaining. Well, with us back at ETS is Ron Johnson. Ron's name is going to be familiar, of course. Uh, for contributing some things on the blog. We've referred to Ron before on the podcast. And Carl Sanders, uh, who we interviewed last year, so that Carl should be familiar to uh, listeners. But what you may not know, I don't. maybe I've mentioned it before, but Carl and Ron are related. Mm-hmm. Okay, what's the relationship? Tell Carl, everybody. Carl married my sister, my okay. older sister, my, my, my much more mature sister. Right. <laughs> that's right, because I am sort of old now, you know, so that, that's just how it is, but... But I'll, it's all right. Age is yeah. a good thing. Well, yeah. you know, I, I'd really like to just sort of chit chat about our history together. But before we do that, we actually have to do something, I guess, substantive. Okay. Uh, I, I just talked we'll to. Pretend you pretend know, it's some substantive, right? <laughs> You'll pretend you're interested, right? <laughs> exactly. That's good. You're good at that, Carl. <laughs> uh, you have to be. That's part of being an academic, too, right? Yep. You sit in Absolutely. many sessions where you pretend you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just We just uh, interviewed earlier uh, Andy Nacelli. And right, Andy, I know who he is. Yes. Okay. And G- Ron, you know who he is? Okay. No. Andy teaches for. Uh, Bethlehem, what is it? Bethlehem Baptist Seminary. It's, yeah, it's, okay. it's John Piper's school, and he's an elder there. Uh, he's he's New Testament guy. His he he has a book out called No No Easy Fix. It's a critique of Keswick theology, the higher okay. life theology. Let go and let God. So I, I'm bringing that up because what he in the interview again what he was articulating about what he's really shooting at is this notion that he objects to the, the having a category where Christians are only ever carnal or, or they never do anything. There's no fruit in their life. So he's objecting to this category okay. because Keswick theology has this category then it has this other category where we have some sort of spiritual, spiritual Christian. experience. Just be carnal? Yeah, the, the, yeah carnal? the carnal Christian versus the spiritual Christian, something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. So that that in turn raises the question of well, and, and this could go a lot of different ways. Like like, what do you do with that? Because what does it mean to have like no fruit at all? Like, is that really even possible? Because uh, I can think of examples where, okay, somebody accepts the gospel, they they feel good about that, and then they go out and get hit by a truck. Well, they were they were they in sanctification there. You know, I would say, yep, they're still believers, even though we don't have opportunity to have fruit. Uh, I could think of other examples where you could have someone understand the gospel and embrace it, but they're never they're never actually taught anything. And that could either be where uh, maybe they don't have Christian friends, maybe it's just somebody in some country where it's really hard, or or having a Christian fellowship can be threatening or evasive, you know, depending on the context. So if they don't know a whole lot of anything, how could we expect, you know, fruit in that situation? So what I'm wondering is, how do you guys think about this category thing, whether it's just Keswick theology or just more generally, uh, can can we have people who are really Christians, and the key words are, who never bear fruit, they never show any evidence of discipleship. Uh, how do you guys think about that? 
Um, I was just talking about this with a friend, so let me jump in first. I asked him over coffee, what do you gain by this? Because he's of, he's of the, you know, the Grace Evangelical Society. And yeah, and, and where, that came up in where the is, They push so hard on assurance. My question to him was, what do you gain out of this? Why, why when Jesus said make disciples, are you trying to convert? And then worry about is conversion turning into discipleship? Why can't I argue for going for the jugular with discipleship right off the bat, thus never having to worry about a category to fill in that unknown space. There must be some value to, the, to even asking the question. I'm, I'm not upset by the question, mm-hmm. but I'm just wondering why have we developed, well, I think I know why, but, I, but I'm challenging this development of thought where we can have Jesus say, make disciples, and we stop short and say, well, he's converted, but... Well, what's between the butt and the discipleship that we value? Yeah, I, and I, I grew up, I think, in at least part of the context I grew up with had a lot of this kind mm-hmm. of idea. So I think probably all of us have heard this kind of teaching in, in a number of contexts. Uh, and I went to Dallas Seminary, which is one place where a lot of this kind of idea has floated around, not for everyone, but right. as a significant uh, influence in the institution. Uh, for me, there's, there's two dimensions. I'm always concerned about the extremes on on both sides. On the one side, on the one hand, I, I'm I think I'm absolutely on board with the idea that there there that that Scripture says there should be fruit. That there really that sure. true conversion results in real fruit. That there should be something there. Something. There must be something. Yeah. Yes. The question. So on that side, I'm totally with. I think where Andy's going in the in the general category. Uh, I'm also, but on the other hand, I'm also concerned about the other extreme where we just become really um, over focused and trying to evaluate people mm-hmm. because the fruit isn't always as obvious as we would like or in categories which we could understand. My biblical example I always use when I talk about with students is Lot. If you read Lot's story in the Old Testament, there's not a lot admirable, although not a lot admirable, I didn't intend that, but anyway, there's not much admirable about Lot's life. Uh, and yet in the New Testament, he's called Righteous Lot. Okay. And why is he called Righteous Lot? Because his soul was vexed. Now, if you look at his actions, I don't see a lot there. Right. But, but yeah, well, I, well, I do see a lot, but not good stuff. Uh, but there, there, was, there was an internal thing going on. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder... If again, well, I agree there should be fruit. I mean, there's just the caution not to be too hyper. I'm figuring I know what that fruit is because right. then you start developing these lists. If you do these five things, you're really converted. If you don't, you're not. Yeah, and that, that, and that, that's that's my that really, that's my tension there. Yeah, and we've all seen that because of our our context and mutual history. Um, we've all seen that sort of devolve into, um, well, I'm doing these things. So therefore, people wouldn't use this, this, this kind of language, at least with what I'm familiar with. But I do these things, so of course I'm a believer, or I deserve, they would never use deserving or merit language. But since they have those things, it, al- it almost is like adding works to it. Because if you took them away, then it's like, oh, is God still happy with me? It, am, am I still you know, right with God? And, and it, it transforms the simplicity of the gospel into some sort of, there's a bit of a performance element there that, that I get concerned about, but I, you know, I'm with you too, that you know, if, if the, if the standard is like never ever for one moment in time showing any kind of fruit that I could detect, well, I, again, I, how, how would I know? And how is that really possible? And is, you know, it, it, well, that's is that I mean, a real category? That's where I would return to the, simple directive to follow me if i am directed by christ to follow him and then i'm i'm asking myself am i showing evidence excuse me of following i just think i'm getting off the beaten track of what christ is is asking me to do so i don't like the question but i know it's being asked all the time i just sure i just avoid it myself it is this this conundrum and i think and i've got good friends who are very active in the grace evangelical group and what was and the answer you got when you would ask that question oh that's a good about, question what, what what do you gain by this what? assurance and if if you follow the grace um, materials closely they keep pushing this issue of assurance that why would god allow us to not have total assurance and they you know first john 5 20 
that you may know. And yeah, I, I'm, my, I, yeah, I'm my, a, I'm my a, first retort is, well, we only can have the assurance that God allows. We can't invent assurance. So whatever now, and I would argue based on a lot of the conversations we've had over the years, the assurance I see the Bible presenting is a God who doesn't lie. God who keeps his promises, yeah. a God who is unlike the gods that my neighbor has. There's my assurance that if I am loyal to this God, I'm in. Mm-hmm. If I'm disloyal, look out below. That's yeah. basically the and assurance. And I think of I'm David. Saying. David could be a hopeless screw up, you know, in right. his life in so many ways, but he never crosses that line. Yeah, he knows, the line. Yeah, he knows where the line it's is. It's not behavior oriented. That's right. the key. It's worship oriented. Yeah. So that's yeah. where I think we're getting off the beaten track is when we say, not us here, but I'm saying that the question is, when were you converted? Give me a date and a time. When did you start growing? I think you're, you're starting to walk down a path that the Bible writer would say, boy, uh, we didn't have these questions. We, we thought of the person's baptism probably of his day of conversion in the sense that he declared Jesus as Lord. Um, and then we have numerous, whether it's Hebrews or other places, numerous times, you know, stick with Christ. Do not leave. Do not leave. So they they weren't asking the question in in the negative like we do, where I, I don't see any growth. What do I do? They were seeing people, 1 John 2.19, walk away. And you could see that, but it wasn't behaviors only. Let me, let me get two more, two more pieces maybe. Uh, first is just... Uh, assurance has to do with our subjective awareness, not with reality. So there are, there are people who are genuinely followers of Christ who don't have assurance for various reasons. You know, the, and so I, I think this focus on assurance shifts it to the subjective piece in, a, in an unhealthy way at some level. Um, similarly, I mean, just working up assurance, I don't, you know, I'm just... I'm not sure that's really the goal after, in the end, right? So I, I, just that focus on assurance, I think, is a little distorted and, and maybe confuses or conflates a couple of categories. The other thing is, and I'm going to follow up on what Ron said, uh, conversion. I, I do think this model is a little caught up in, I'm going to get, be in trouble here, a single moment conversion model. Mm-hmm. Rather than viewing conversion as it really is in most human experiences, more complex. It has stages and elements, and you don't necessarily always know the moment you cross over. I mean, we like to think, I mean, some of us have dramatic conversions where we can say, yesterday I wasn't, today I am. That's, but there are lots of people who, if you look at their experience, you know, their, their right. subjective experience, right. they, they see, I wasn't here, and five years later I am somewhere yeah. in the middle of there. I'm, I'm, I'm here now, but I can't really tell you at what point the line and, and, was and, crossed. And Gordon Smith, I think it is, has a, a book called uh, Beginning Well or Starting Well. I forget the title now, but it's on conversion. And he says that conversion has, at least ideally, has a number of elements, faith and repentance, but also baptism and joining a community of faith. All those things are the normal, that's what that back what Ron was talking about, the discipleship yeah. thing. They're, and they, so they contribute to getting you to over to, here as opposed to some and, other. And it's not this magic. You have to check this list because some people don't get all of them and are still right with God at their moment of death. They got hit by the bus, right? You know, whatever mm-hmm. in the, pro- but uh, so it's not that there is a, there isn't a, a reality of, of becoming a child of God, but that in our subjective awareness of it, our realization of it, it's not always a precise moment. I was talking to a Lutheran pastor once in this kind of conversation, and he looked at me without any... Uh, he, was, he was angry with me for asking the question when I got saved. Or He looked at me and he said, when it came to how do you know when you became a Christian or when did I become a Christian, he said, when did you realize your father loved you? And that was his answer. In other words, it's got to be a path. It's got to be a progression. It's got to be a realization almost. It, it's a realization more than a decision. For, for those of us who grew up in, particularly in kind of evangelical world, I grew up, um, and I see a, a lot of Bible college students, some of you guys may have seen this as well, students who really struggle with this notion of when did I become a Christian? Am I really a Christian? Because they couldn't pinpoint that moment, Yeah, you know, and so they struggle and they, then they pray and then if I really didn't mean it, I'll pray again. And they go through this really and they'll stressful. Go out and they'll go out and fall into sin. And, it, well, I guess it I didn't, guess it didn't take. Or, right. And rather than yeah. saying, you know, for, for many people who grow up particularly in Christian homes, it, it's there, but 
subjectively we don't have a moment and, and you know we don't have a date you know we want that date and, and i just don't see that as kind of a biblical model or requirement and that i think ties in with this that if we see it as a moment then we have this we can have this conversion whatever if we see it as more of a process or at least having a process experience from us the, from the human side uh, we see more journey? like a, am i willing to be on a journey with christ that's how i see my own conversion Right now, today, am I willing to be on this journey with him? If the answer is yes, then I may, to use an anachronistic term, really, I'm a Christian. But back then, they probably wouldn't have called it that. They would have said, he's a follower of Christ, Mm -hmm. he's a disciple. Well, I was just interested what what your take was, because, again, you have this, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm just getting hit with a lot of this lately. (laughs) You know, you're just running into people, but and maybe the content on the podcast, too, because we're in Hebrews now. But since I don't see the, you know, like this list of things either in myself or somebody else, do you know, did I lose my salvation? Did I, maybe I never had it. And, and, and we take, again, what should be this progress and we make it, we make our works part of what, what the gospel is. And we, 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 we just, we, we take something simple like, um, you know, Romans 5.8 is what I keep going back to. While we were at sinners, Christ died for us. Before we even had a single thought, uh, before we cared one iota of what God thought about us, he still loves us. So why do we think we have to give God this disposition toward us now it, it, it by rips, doing rips, certain it things? It rips the joy in one yeah. sense out of salvation, right? Because salvation ought to be a joyful experience. I mean, it, it isn't always joyful. I mean, we we have those moments of crisis or struggle or whatever. But, but still, there ought to be at the root of it this this joyful thing rather than this fearful thing. But fair enough that most of the questions I get on this are from parents wondering about their kids, especially their adult children. How do I know that my 20-year-old is a Christian? Well, when he was eight, he said this. I hear that all the time, or at least too much, I guess, and it makes me nervous that we're trying to think about the other person's situation when it comes to discipleship, which is always dangerous territory. So, Well... On a lighter note, you know, see, see, this is the point, Carl, what I'd love to segue into your memoir. Oh, oh, yes, my memoir. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you still thinking about writing your memoir? It, 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 it lurks, lurks in the background of my mind. I'm not, I'm waiting for the right moment to, to, <laughs> to, to, to produce my memoir. I, I don't know if you want to give us the title of your memoir. Should I? But, <laughs> um... I guess I can. I'll, I'll, I'll slightly well, give us the story, and then that'll lead. To okay. The... All right. Well, the story is um, I, I was teaching, uh, and I had a student who came from uh, a pretty rough background. Uh, you know, he, he he was dealing with some advising issues, courses he needed to take, and whatever. And uh, he's one of those guys. I, I really liked him. He's a, a good kid, but you know, he's all tatted up in piercings, and you know punk metal rock stuff. You know, that was his. <laughs> that was his background. And he's, he's telling me, he says. Um, you know, I just, uh, I used to just hate Christians. I hated Christianity. That was the, just, I just hated that. And then I became a Christian and suddenly I find myself at Bible college. And then I asked myself, how the bleep did I end up at Bible <laughs> college? So I, I, I thought of that perhaps as an interesting title <laughs> for a book, uh, arising out of that experience. What, what, you know, what brought me here and to all the, to this wonderful and one level, but also weird world yeah. of the Bible college. Because, I mean, I had wonderful, I mean, I taught at uh, Washington Bible College for 10 years, and I've taught at other colleges uh, as adjunct before that. And boy, I had wonderful experiences, great students I loved. I still connect with many of them. And, you know, so I, I mean, it was one, but boy, there were a lot of weird and strange and silly things that happened along the way, too. I mean, I think that happens in a lot of churches. I mean, people can empathize with those. Let, let's, those. Let, for, for our listeners, let's, we can all share uh, one of our strange teaching moments or something like that. Hmm. Do you, do you remember, do you remember? Ron, you're uh, in, in hermeneutics class, where you did, where you modeled the uh, the exegetical process on the letter from your mom. Oh yeah, I was a teacher. It was, it was one a, of my favorite moments. Actually, yeah, that was that was just a group, of, you know, just a bunch of guys on the side. But yeah, I know. But but I I asked you to bring oh. it into class. Remember, well, you're going to have I to taught, remind me of how that. Well, I taught out hermeneutics then. class, and uh, again, well, here's the background. Okay. I was taught the classical way of presenting a sermon is. 
uh, observation and uh, just you know t interpretation. tearing a yeah, tearing a text piece. apart down to the level of trying to get behind the writer yeah. and every e verb every and word, every noun. Yeah. And so I decided, and this was just on a on a whim because I was so frustrated. I took a letter from my mother, an actual letter, and it was about going to a garage sale and just just, just a nice paragraph of what moms talk about. And I did an ex ex an exegetical expose of my mom's letter down to the level and i i put it somewhere for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i can imagine down to the level of i didn't know what in the world she meant right that 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 you all know, the meaning was lost all the <laughs> meaning is lost once you dig enough you know garage sale now becomes about garages and sales and you lose the sense of what it is so i guess i gave that to you and you used it in, in class but uh, that was just born out of yeah total, total frustration i i just remember it in hermeneutics you know sort of illustrating the point that when, because the letter was short, and you know we read it for the class, and it's honestly it was kind of perfectly obvious what in the world your mom was talking about. <laughs> but then when you like when you take every every word of it and sort of explode it, mm -hmm. and you separate all the parts out and scrutinize each part, and, and then you get to the end of that, you've talked a lot about. You lost sight of the entire meaning. You, 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 we, we learned about what vocabulary your mom uses yeah. and, you know, what, what patterns of speech mom uses. Well, this is another oh, memory I have. I of just the lost same, the whole thing. It was the same teacher, actually, in seminary. And I probably told, told, told you the story, but I prepared several hours, five or six hours for this sermon. And I got a D plus, first year preaching class. And I go back to my house, my apartment, and newly married, and I get a call from a fellow student and he said, I heard you got a really bad grade on a rebellious sermon. Rebellious? <laughs> rebellious. <You mean> rebellious? <laughs> well, because I didn't follow the, you know, one, two, three in the alliterations and so forth. So I just made this deal with myself out of frustration. I set my egg timer on the, on the kitchen stove to 10 minutes <laughs> and I studied for my next sermon. And when that timer went off, I stopped studying and I got an A minus on the sermon. And I'll never I have forget. a parallel story. It's just, from my, it's, it's just I, because you're gifted, Ryan. I, 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 have, I have a parallel story from my seminary days too. Okay. So also, this was uh, I was I was taking theology at uh, at the seminary I was at, and I was taking both years of theology at the same time. It was a weird scheduling glitch, so I had two classes going on at the same time. And this teacher designed so all the assignments were due on the same day for both classes. So I had two midterms on the same day and two 20 page theology papers sure. due on the same, you know, it's just one of those things. So here's the reality, you know, you, you, you I, I had two topics. So the first one I really worked on, you know, I just, I really researched it. I thought it through. It was on, I think on the human constitution, you know, body, soul, spirit, those kind of things. I said, well, you know, it's, it's the biblical focus is more on the unity of the human human person, and I worked through all this, and I think I did a really good job. Re and, you know, uh, and the second one was the one. Well, okay, the paper's due tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to spread a bunch of books on the kitchen table, and I'm going to write a 20 page paper in one night. It was something like maybe sure. it was done day and a half, but it was you know that was the one I didn't have time to. And so basically, I just followed the teacher's outline. Okay. From the class, you know, and, and plugged in the appropriate quotes and, you know, all the things that students learn to do when they're good students. And when I got them back, uh, the one I really slaved over got an A on it. But the one I had just cranked out, matching his note, they got A, good job. <laughs> <laughs> and that just taught me something about what the expectation was for the course. It was It was not about thinking creatively or really th developing theologically, it was reproduce what I gave you. I didn't really care about I that. Laymen are surprised at these stories. They think seminary well, that's, is full. That's why I want you to tell It's full of, of, of creative thought where people are in a circle and, and thinking, you know, beyond Sitting the teacher the and so of, forth. Of the sage and all But this. it's not. It is. No, not we're, really. we're, we're, we're busy people and you learn how the teacher thinks, think like him or her. Produce the answers there, th and, yeah, and, and some, some teachers are more like that than others, obviously. Right. And I try as a teacher to not be like that. I mean, I want to be fair. So, like uh, when I teach a class and we cover a controversial topic, oh, spiritual gifts yeah. or something, or election or whatever, and I'm going to have students writing on both sides of that paper. I try to be meticulously fair. I may be even a little harsher on the people who agree with me because I want them to do a better job. But you know, you can write an A and disagree with me. And I, it can be a good paper. Mm -hmm. I, may, I may 
put some comments on, did you think about this? Yeah. Right. But, but I, I try very hard to do that, but it's really hard to do that. And it takes more time and effort as well. So, mm -hmm. so what are some things that, uh, your students have done to you in class stuff that you've run, uh, that students have done to you? Well, I got the, I, the, uh, the paper, it was, it was a, a bad student who gave me a wonderful paper at the end of the summer you know, it was an independent study. And, of course uh, it was. <laughs> yes. I think I know what's I got a, <laughs> You know this, this story, story I, Mike. Yes. I got a journal in the mail, and it, had, it was exactly the same paper as the student. And so I called the student in, and I pretended I didn't know. I just said, this is a wonderful paper. Thank you for your work. Here's an article <laughs> that you probably should have referenced. It's... It just came out, but it, it's it's very good. I'd, I'd like you to see it. So I pushed it across my desk to him to, just to see his his reaction, and he was perfect. He he looked at it and said, "Yeah, Prof. Johnson, that's a good article." And I looked at him <laughs> and, I, and I just said, "What happened here?" And apparently, he had talked to this guy earlier in the summer before he had sent it to the journal, and just copied it. So if I hadn't seen it coming around the back end, I never would have known. But. Yeah. That, that, so that, did, that takes a did, lot of nerve. Did he, to did he learn a, a lifelong lesson? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know he graduated, but I mean, I yeah, I mean, I think we all have stories of, of uh, like that of various yeah. kinds of plagiarism and things like that. Sometimes, I most often, I mean, my funny ones are when they turn in something. I had a student once turn in something, and you could see like the hyperlinks and things from the web page they copied it from. You know, it's like they're not even good at, at this. You know, that that's that. You know, at least be competent. I mean, I'm glad you aren't because it's easy to catch you. But uh, but uh, it it it's it's. It happens way too often. I would, at the beginning of every semester, I'd give this long talk. Don't plagiarize. I will almost certainly catch you. These are horrible meetings. I hate them. You will not like them at all. Right. And, you know, please don't do this. It's not that hard to footnote something and all that. And it still would happen. And, you know, and yeah. it's, it's, that's, uh, uh, that's frustrating to be sure. I mean, it's. Uh yeah, well, I, I taught at uh, Western Washington for three years. It's a Division II school. And I had a guy, he, again, I don't want to caricature student athletes too much, but that's what we were dealing with here. <laughs> okay. So, so he, he turned in just a, a really poor paper uh, one semester. It was, it, was, it was a history class. And stuff. It was just terrible, you know thrown together probably in 10 minutes and you know kind of what you'd expect for the the guy who's majoring in basket weaving you know and has to take this class and whatever so he, he fails this paper I, I don't know what he got for this semester but i had him for the next semester in a different class and at the end of the class he turned in the same paper then he, <laughs> so he plagiarized himself, <laughs> but it was like, there's no improvement here. You know, it, it left such an impression on me that I, I had not forgotten about it, but it's like, really? Like you're turning in the same F paper for a different class. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Could you not like see the same to the same person? <laughs> every once in a while I have things like that where I can't prove I mean, it's not necessarily a bad paper, yeah. but like they turn in a paper that has nothing to do with the assignment. Yeah. But it seems to have something to do with another class I know that's in their <laughs> curriculum. And I'm pretty confident I know what happens, but sometimes you just don't have the ability to chase it down. Right. But I get quite suspicious about those moments when uh, that kind of stuff happens. But yeah. it's, it's, I, well, I, I shared earlier that story, but a student who, uh, who, uh, this is a graduate level turns in this paper. It's, well, it's just a short paper. It's 14 point font and double space, extra double space. Now just between just so paragraphs. listeners know, this is a recent experience. Fairly recent experience. Yes. <laughs> uh, a master's level class, no resources, nothing. So it was a crap paper. I mean, it was really bad. And, uh, and I, I felt like I was grading a junior high paper because that's what you do in junior high. You know, you make the font larger, you know, you, you add headings where you don't need headings because you really don't need a heading in a two page paper. But they put them in, right? You know, every paragraph gotta has hit a heading. The page count, you got to yeah. hit the page count, right? And, and, you know, I just, I, yeah, I, I 
Uh, I let the student kind of have it and said, this is unacceptable. And he says, oh, I'm just so busy. I'm just doing God stuff. And it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're just a bad student. And you don't, you want credit for not doing any work, but oh, well, uh, we just, we just, you know, some students want to learn and a lot don't, unfortunately. I, I wish they yeah. all did. And I try to make it so it's possible for them to learn, but. <laughs> not always successful not always successful unfortunately yeah well boy we could go on and on i think because what i'd really you know other than your memoirs and some of your specific my, uh, my, my, can, can one, one of my favorite stories is when you're all sitting there in coats and there's no heat in the class oh, yes. yeah we had we had some <laughs> issues we had uh problems with the heater and we this all yes Folks, this is what happens at little Bible colleges. <laughs> Sometimes it does. So, and these you need to support them. Yeah, yeah, they really need help. So, uh, we're yeah, there wasn't heat in the classroom building, so the students are all huddled in their coats and hats, and and uh, I wasn't too bad because I'm always kind of a little warm blooded anyway. So yeah. I kind of like the the cold room, but it was it was chilly and 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 things like that. And the students, some of the students were so great. They had great attitudes. Well, we're preparing for the mission field. And so this is, you know, this is, this is preparation. For we're that. all going well, to that's, Siberia. That's, that's a great attitude. Uh, if I were a parent, I wouldn't have been so happy. Let me tell you the one dining hall one. You remember okay. this one, right? Oh, the, uh, yeah. The, uh, there was a, an issue with the, the, the uh, dining hall service company and uh, they bailed on us. Um, that was the kind of, yeah. And so, uh, so uh oliver twist is coming to mind <laughs> yeah this is it was, it was so it's lunchtime and they just grabbed the student workers and told them prepare something for lunch so everyone walks into the cafeteria and there in the at the place where you get your lunch here's what they were serving beets and couscous <laughs> that was it that was the lunch menu at this college for lunch, for that day beets and couscous and so you saw the steady stream of people walking in looking at the thing walking out and going to <laughs> mcdonald's or burger king or That's whatever good. so if you so, like beets and couscous, if you like beets and couscous day, it, yeah. was, it was it was christmas if you like beets and couscous but so to this uh, day uh many of the people who were there that day all you have to do to get them laughing is just say beets and couscous <laughs> it's like a, it's like a secret code you know you're in the club so uh so i mean it just you know these kind of things happen and again i, I don't want to be i'm not being overly because nice, so, i say wonderful so we're not going to talk about the you know give us give us your gold that oh, moment. cash for gold well no we're not going to talk about the cash for gold <laughs> fundraising campaign that was that was not a good thing either but that was that's i've got it's chapters. too easy to identify I've got the school yeah, it, it might be uh, i'm probably already in trouble so uh but uh yes i've got chapter titles yeah cash for gold beats and couscous <laughs> <laughs> you know these are some of my chapter titles you know that i've that, they're just stories that you know there's this, there's clusters of stories and again many wonderful people and, and self-sacrificing people but you know the school financially near the end this was struggling essentially sure. went under at the end like a number of schools have done not that not that recent recently and yeah. not that long ago yeah. um and so when you're trying to prop something up at the end and trying to make it go and people believe in what they're doing you know they believe in teaching the bible and in working with students and all of that uh, it's amazing what people will put up yeah the abuse they'll allow themselves to be subjected to for something like that and so i i want to be respectful and honor that heart of sacrifice and service that was there and the students who really wanted to learn I still remember talking to one of the alumni who i, I still have a good relationship with uh and uh, even after was, this story or... <laughs> even after several <laughs> after a number of these stories yes and he he told me he said yeah i had a friend of ours ask about you know should we, i go to this school and he said boy you know we went there we had great bible teaching we had great friends it was a wonderful experience no you should not go there <laughs> just because of all these right. administrative kind of things. And I could understand yeah. that, but it wasn't the most encouraging word to hear, right? We, we, we struggled to do the best we can. I think we did a, a good job in many ways, but yeah. uh, unfortunately it was not enough to to make it a going concern long term so if you're if you're ever in the northwest again i i have to remember this we'll have you over and have beets and couscous just, to, just <laughs> that was, boy that that would be that would be special mike I, <laughs> I would thank you so much for that we haven't had that in quite a while you know so. yeah i'm sure 
So what are you what are you guys doing these days? I know we should get a little bit of an update. Um, Carl, we'll start with you. Where, uh, what are you, what are you teaching? Uh, I'm teaching full load. mostly courses on theology of culture, a couple of different things. One that deals with uh, technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you going to the nanotech paper tomorrow? The transhumanism. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm still working my way through the program, just okay. because of it. but uh, but there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff where we we think about how we engage culture, how we you know that's one of the, uh, a lot of seminaries is particularly we focus a lot on biblical teaching and mm-hmm. exposition. That's good. But most of the time of the people in the church is spent outside the church walls. So helping them figure out how to live in their careers, how to mm-hmm. uh, engage the world around them, their neighborhood, how to process media, how to think wisely about technology. Because yeah. I don't think we're going back. I'm, and I'm not, I don't advocate that. I'm not giving up my smartphone. But the smartphone has changed the world. Uh, Carl Truman, I think, recently had an article where he said uh, the real, real reformer wasn't Luther. It was Henry Ford. Because the car turned the church into a commu- uh, 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 a commuter thing and basically made it a commodity. Yeah. So you can drive to the church you like. And that transformed American Christianity. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't think of the way technology shapes these things. So the Amish, I, I say this in class all the time, Amish are, don't have cars, not because cars are evil, but because cars destroy community. Mm. Yeah, and we and can see that. you know, and so if you think, if you at least can begin to process how technology works that way, again, I'm not giving up my car, but I can begin to think: Are there ways I can work against that, or compensate for that, or figure out alternative ways to build community in light Jew, of that? Uh, to a Jewish um, author, talk about how for American Judaism, the car, the idea of being allowed, the rabbis decided they could drive to Sabbath services. And when that decision was made somewhere in Cincinnati back in the mid-60s or whatever, it changed Judaism across the country because now people are driving to synagogue instead of everyone walking to their local. And hmm. he made a big point that that was a huge re- reformation so anyway, within no, that's Judaism. Interesting. So just think about things like that. And again, that, that's just one illustration, but trying to help students engage this stuff more intelligently and thoughtfully so they can actually have an impact in their churches and help their parishioners relate yeah. to the world, engage the world better. So that's been uh, my teaching. That's probably my biggest focus over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So aside from my side project on biblical language pedagogy, which is <laughs> totally disconnected to that, but there you go. I just, yeah. you know, uh, things happen. And there, so, uh, Ron, what's the latest with you? I'm an instructional designer at United Health Group, and I have two very active Bible studies that I prepare every week, and about a dozen people sitting in a circle talking. Uh, the second one, or one of them is uh, composed of mainly non-churched, younger, well, disenchanted, disenchanted Christians, younger. They're all unmarried, uh, and they've been coming to this house church. Actually, it is for about seven years, and uh, just a delightful group. Boy, are they mm-hmm. are they willing to sit and just open up and talk about their thoughts and not get preached to? I'm, I'm noticing that. So yeah, I, you were telling me about this last night, and uh, again, some. A good number of people in our audience are going to know that you, you know, you were pastoring and you're not, you know, like in a traditional sense and you're not now. Right. But since you've been in that context, the the house church thing, do you have any thoughts on that in, in your exposure to it? I do. Pros, I mean, cons, things you still wonder about. The way we do it is very open ended, which, again, in a sermon that I used to prepare for a church, 15 some years of that, it's it's always, you know, 32 minutes. It ends with a bow tie at the top. Um, you have to apply this text to 100 different people in 75 different ways. And to me, that wasn't matching my personality. So what we do now are these two uh, Bible studies I'm involved in. We just read the Bible in a circle, stop and talk about it and uh, admit where we don't understand and dig in where we do and the honesty of being able just to talk back. I, I, I've often wondered in the earliest church, if it was set up like the synagogue, I don't believe the synagogue had a, had a sermon portion to it. I mean, from what I understand, the effect is coming from the same Jewish author I was just uh, talking about the, the American uh, synagogue started a, 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 a homily or a sermon because they were jealous of the American church system, the Protestant churches that had this homily idea of, you know, 
15 minutes uninterrupted um, soliloquy. And this Jewish author was saying that we as Jews, Jews had never thought of that, of actually having a prepared soliloquy by one person. We've always been, you know, talk it out. And so I, I put that back into the first century, shall we say, and, and I, I think we would do better. Well, let's back up. Is there a place for a half-hour sermon? Sure. But I think on a day or week, to week basis of the Christian, well, let's get back to the question of following Christ versus making a, con a, a conversion statement. Following Christ to me means you're engaged in this process. Well, what better way to be engaged than to have a back and forth conversation with your quote unquote pastor, whoever that person is, whether it's a Bible study leader or whatever. Um, this is what is filling in for their church now is just talking about scripture. And we go, what, 630 to 10. So what is that? Three and a half hours. Of, of pretty engaging conversation, very honest. Did you have a meal or mm. finger food? or We honey? eat, yeah. Was, yeah. Someone always brings food or the person that we have it at their house, they always provide some. And, but we sit and talk and eat. And again, food's always part of a good theological conversation. I, so. I, I do think it's interesting that uh, this idea of a more dialogical thing, um, it, it's, it's culturally, I think it's becoming... I don't know if it's a necessity, but something that makes more sense. Uh, I mentioned in the paper I did earlier today, this book, a secular book called The End of Power. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's just talking about how just because of things like social media and technology and all sorts of things, uh, this idea of the top-down model, someone controlling things, right. everything is, is a lot harder to do because people can bypass you. You know, you may think you control your church, but someone goes and posts something on Facebook, right. <laughs> and it's it's gone. You know, you, you don't so much you, for that. Yeah. So much yeah. for that. So it, it that that's again one of those ways technology is contributed. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the big drivers. Well, anyone can of this. tweet. Yeah. And so, you know, just having ways to do that at our church uh, in the last year or two, the pastor has tried. We do it most Sundays, not every Sunday, but most Sundays the sermon is done. We try to have time for questions. Wow. Mm -hmm where people can ask questions. So I've preached uh, several times in the last couple of months. And so you, you stop 10 minutes before the end of the service or 15 minutes yeah. and you say, okay, questions. And people will ask you, well, what did you mean when you said this? Or, or how would you apply this? Or what about this? This doesn't make sense with this particular experience. Yeah. And I think that's a very healthy thing because it helps people be engaged. And those questions, if a person asks a question, more than likely five or ten other people have that same question lurking mm -hmm. in their minds but are afraid to ask it. So I think creating the culture where on a we're much more open to that I think is a good thing. And on a practical course. note, we have someone in our group that actually is looking around the room while I'm talking, usually, and she'll call on someone who hasn't talked in an hour and say, Mary, what do you think? And that's, that's a good way to, not just the person like me who's speaking mm -hmm. or talking or running it, but someone's on the lookout to get so-and-so engaged whenever she wants to. And that, that, that's been really helpful. Yeah. Obviously what I'm describing mm -hmm. at church isn't nearly as, as intense as what you're doing around, but mm -hmm. I think it still reflects that same yeah. kind of more openness to say we're, we're not, we don't know everything mm -hmm. and we may not have addressed everything that you need to, to know about here or want to know about here. So let's kind of, create space for that. And I think that's a good thing. And so, you know, those kind of models like mm -hmm. Ron is at uh, are, are really, uh, they, they, that's a natural part and, of that. And I, I can tell you, I study a lot more for these two Bible studies than I ever did for a sermon. So sure. because yeah. I have to be prepared to go off the beaten track on so many different levels. And, and plus it just pulls in all these things I've been doing over the years too. You, you never stay on one topic very long because the questions start coming from every angle. Hmm. So... Oh, well, thanks, you guys, uh, for the chat. A little bit of, you know, a little bit of fun, a little bit of theology. Uh, that's that, That's been our experience. I mean, we've known each other for how long? I mean, it's good grief. 30. 30, 30, yeah, over 30, 30 years. At least 30, Something yeah. like we've that. We've all been yeah, married 30 think. some years, right? Yeah. So. so. I hit 30 this year. Yeah, 31 so, for us. Yeah. Yep, I'm the old man. We're at, <laughs> <laughs> we're at 36 all this right. year, so. Well, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, we're back uh, at ETS, and we are here essentially for part two with Ron Johnson and Carl Sanders. Now, I, I had asked Ron to sort of give us a verbal thought experiment. So in some ways, this will sort of model what we often do at these meetings, where one of us will have some idea percolating, and you know, we just sort of throw it out, 
and it's it's something half baked, but it's good to sort of just get it out there and have it take a pounding a little bit. Yep. Um, you know, or a little bit of a, of a massage, or we we hear something and say, "Yeah, you're just spot on." Uh, that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> but no, but I, I'm, I'm interested to hear your exercise. reaction. So, so to your audience, you've never heard me say this before. In fact, nobody has. Yep, uh, this will this will be new for all of us. New. So we're yeah. we're playing is, without a net. We're, we're used to Ron's good at this. He's had many of these <laughs> over the years. So that's a thinking this is alone, not a new it's never been a problem. But Take like I said, it does get you fired at times. Um, <laughs> well, we won't. I, uh, we promise we won't fire you. Well, you can't done. fire me now, just so you know. My boss doesn't care at United Health. What my theology is. <laughs> um, I was listening to podcast sixty three a, 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 a while back. It's about. Um, Leviticus. It was your introductory thoughts on Leviticus, and you had mentioned the concept of sacred space. Now, I had thought about that, but your podcast made me start to put some dots together, and so I'm just going to throw out some thoughts to you and see what you think of them. Um, I'm big on theological experimentation in the sense of like an engineer standing on the shoulders of someone that has come before and yet being willing to reconsider and say, have we thought about this? And then to test drive those ideas and see where they either fall apart or they work better than ever before. You know, and if if, if the engine runs better than it did uh, uh, before, then maybe there's something to it. So here's where I'm currently test driving. I'll call it sacred space. Um, I'm I'm wondering to myself, even as I go through this, how many theological questions, problems, issues it solves, and where to stop the experiment. So starting with, let's say, Leviticus, sacred space. The idea is, and I I forget, actually, Mike, how much you said here, but here's how I take it. So they, do I. So yeah. it's, we're the, okay. <laughs> the question being asked in Leviticus, if not much of the Old Testament, is not how, you, you, you know, Growing up, we had this picture of you're standing on one cliff and you got heaven on the other and you got hell in between. And then, of course, across that is laid the cross. And the way to get saved is to walk, you, you know, literally use Jesus to walk across and get to heaven. I would recommend that the picture of the Old Testament is not how to get across, but how to get in. The idea of moving toward a sacred space, let's say the Holy of Holies, one man, one time a year. There's different levels of this, of course, but whether it be the atoning uh, moment of a sacrifice or the work of a priest daubing blood here and there, that, that, that the question on the mind of the Old Testament person, even the righteous person, was not how to get across, but how to get in or toward or how to approach an otherwise dangerous deity like Yahweh. With that in mind, I'm wondering where that ever stops. So let's play it out. In Acts 15, let's jump all the way to the New Testament epistles. Isn't it true here comes the experiment, that the question for Paul and Peter was not how to get people into the family of Abraham. That was settled through faith. But how to get people at the same table, Acts 15 and on. Thus the question, for like a Cornelius, was a sacred space question. This man is a Gentile. He's unclean. How to solve his, uh, his, his cleanliness really runs much of Acts. If not, think of Paul's letters. Are they not driving... For example, his collection of the Gentile offerings to take to Jerusalem, it seems that he's nervous, he says this at one point, that they would accept that money, which would have been Gentile money, unclean money, and his, his concern was that they wouldn't accept it. So, I'm, and I'm just thinking of various texts here where Paul is, is trying to tell the Gentile in so many ways what Peter told Cornelius through God's help, that his question of being able to approach the God of Israel is solved. It's done. There's no more uh, nervousness, there shouldn't be anyway, on the part of a Gentile. And here's the question then, when did that happen? Now the sheet uh, story of Acts 10 comes into play, but could that not be telling the story after it actually happened, thus recalling the de the death of Christ? That what Jesus did in atoning on the cross was a sacred space issue, period. Are you, are you asking when Gentiles became aware of this or when Jews became aware of it? Or is, so or, far or, both. Or is, or is this a metaphysical thing? Well, then, okay, then the, that's where I would back up and I would say Ruth, Rahab, Naaman, you have pictures of Gentile inclusion all the way through the Old Testament. So that would, uh, Isaiah 49, the idea that the, that, mm -hmm. that the nations will come. <clears throat> So you do have portents of it. You do have pictures of it happening so that when Peter is, is confronted by the dream, the vision, the, the reader even, besides Peter, 
would have known what the answer should have been. But Peter, of course, in his obstinacy, has to get taught it three times. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I'm, I'm also, well... Yeah, I'm thinking, uh, maybe I'll pick up, because yeah, I'm, I'm thinking... I'm wondering yeah, the, one specific thing, but I'm going to hold on to it. Yeah, so. I think yeah, the, I'm thinking of the metaphysical <clears throat> part of it. So, okay. when, so I think of the portrayal of the rending of the veil. Okay. Three times the, in three the, Gospels. Well, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and particularly I think Mark's Gospel, I'm not as familiar with the other ones, but I remember working through Mark uh, a long time ago. But Mark's Gospel, you've got uh, a Gentile centurion... right. Right there, right? Mm-hmm. Who claims this truly this man was the son of God. And then you have the women who were disciples who right. used to follow Jesus, but have been kind of invisible until suddenly, mm-hmm. well, suddenly I think it's they're all visible there. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah. I do too, but yeah. I mean, it's kind of hidden. But the, the opening of the veil suddenly says, this place is open to everyone. I mean, it kind of, in a sense, in Mark's telling, the account is he's, he's positioning the characters in his narrative yeah. in such a way he's saying, that now the veil's broken. It's not just Jews. It's Gentiles. It's women. It's the excluded, and and that's part of so what's the narrative purpose. So is you're going on. you're arguing that the positioning of characters like, you know, women, which would have been a sort of a sub a peripheral class, and Gentiles, that that that's deliberate and it has something to do with the torn veil imagery. I think so. I think the way that's the way Mark lays that out. At least that's the way I have yep. read that story. And so what? so that would be if, if that's the case then I would say that's maybe the metaphysical moment in a sense the crucifixion and obviously the rest of the work of Christ associated with it but that's right. kind of the dynamic moment when that's there. Now the understanding of it that takes some time and processing what this means would be so i'm i'm at least i'm intrigued at least a little bit by by that as my pastor question. said and this is he's going through acts he said in just one of his sermons he said if you have been told no all your life how big would the yes have to be and my suspicion here's my theory the atonement itself is the yes to the gentile in other words the Jew knows what atonement is. He had it in Torah all his life. The Gentile never had it. They they were never available to it. So when Jesus dies, Hebrews 13 something, 13, 12, he died outside the camp. Let us therefore go to him who's outside the camp. The picture there seems to be he didn't die on the you know, on a on, on an altar in front of the temple where you would have expected it. He died out there. The out there then is used by the writer to say there it is. There's our Gentile atonement that we've been waiting for. And that's, well, like I say, that's my thought experiment. Is that enough? Is, is, is atonement relegated just to sacred space a big enough reason for Christ to die? I think in our current Western model, we would say no, and we run toward all sorts of atonement theories as though we've got to have this big, well, we have to have, have, have meaning far beyond sacred space. But if sacred space is important to that world enough that Peter would not allow Cornelius at the same table, and Paul was commissioned by Jesus three times in Acts, it's clear it's to a Gentile audience he's going to go, is sacred space a big enough issue to run the engine of the epistles, of Acts, even of Jesus' atonement, going back into to Mark itself? And, and, and when he would walk around and he would say, be cleansed, what is he doing? Then he says, go to the temple and show them. I, to me, that's a sacred space issue once again. Um, forgiveness of sins. We often think in the judicial sense of going to heaven because I'm forgiven. I don't see it that way. Again, go back to, you know, to Leviticus. When they were forgiven of sins, it was for a sacred space moment or, if, or for a sacred space um, uh, solution. It wasn't for a moral one. You know, and so... Um, right, it was to make, make them fit for sacred space to... Decontaminate sacred space, or right? Protect it from defilement. When Jesus, when Mark is a two, he's he's eating with with sinners, and they're upset about it. And Jesus says, "Well, I didn't come for the righteous; I came for the sinner." Again, I, to me, that would solve or the 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 question of of sanctification, even of purification, of cleansing. Jesus isn't actually going out <clears throat> metaphysically doing it. He is showing what has already come true in the character of Yahweh in all these stories leading up to, you know, the Messiah coming. So the John 1, 17, he, you know, the Torah brings us uh, the law, but Jesus brings us grace and truth, grace and truth in, in, in the sense of a kind of favor that the Gentile needed that they didn't have under Torah 
and the kind of truth telling or promise keeping is that word usually is used that there is a promise being brought to the Gentiles that again what I'm saying is the Gentile could be right with God be you know before Jesus came we know that but did they know that did did the Gentile know that they could approach the God of Israel without Jesus if he had never shown up if Jesus had never come would the Gentile know that they're accepted and it seems that no they wouldn't have without what Jesus did and without Paul explaining what Jesus did, whether in his death or even the resurrection, you know, being the Lord of all, Acts 10. He is now uh, solving priestly actions for all people, uh, not just the Jew. I, I think there's, there's some interesting things here. And certainly, I mean, I, we don't, we tend to just kind of, because of the people we are, we don't think in, in, in the same kind of geographical way that right. biblical Writers well, and early readers did. Think so, of where Jesus so does his work. That's, that's in Galilee. Part, in Galilee, yeah. Galilee is a different place than Jerusalem, and yeah. the journey to Jerusalem is such a big deal in, yeah. in the Gospels as well, and all that. So there's, there's certainly yeah, something yeah. there that's worth yeah, historically. Worth the, Galilee had a lot of Gentile. Yeah. So, so there's certainly some yeah. interesting things to explore here. I, I, I would <laughs> probably at least one level I'd push back. Uh, and this happens a lot of times when you have a, an idea you're playing with. Uh, Maybe you're trying to push it too far to make it the exclusive. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a kaleidoscope guy on atonement. I mean, I think the atonement yeah, I, it, I it, it has um, has I multiple. Don't, I don't need to pick one. So I don't. But how I don't, come? I don't. Let I, me challenge you back. Because Three. because there are different. I think because the in the biblical text there are different ways of describing the atonement that seem to ex describe different yeah. things. And I so agree. this, you can, this, you can this have, would be this would be another this could be another one that I think could be a useful well, thing it to relates build in. To, okay, sacred space, fine. Well who occupies the sacred space? Well right. that would be God. So you have this reconciliation sort of thing going on. Read Second Corinthians five. It's right there. Right. <clears throat> so we, but, but we have I, the ministry of reconciliation, yeah. but notice what comes after that. You still have to respond. See the difference in this view of atonement now would be that the atonement causes the question to be asked. It doesn't solve it for anyone. It just means now the Gentiles allowed in, the wall is down, Colossians 2, but now you've got to make a choice. What are you going to do with this God? And so to me, the atonement question is solved in this sense. You don't have to worry about universal or limited. That's 16th century. Just leave that and go back to the text and say, what does the atonement <laughs> actually do? It what makes everyone have history. to answer the question, what you will you do with Yahweh? Uh, he knows I'm not going to fight him too much. I, I know. You're, you're, you're happy on that uh, one. Oh, I was going to say on this one. Go ahead. The three synoptics, they are written after Paul, right? They're, they're written late. They're all, I mean, just walk it through again in your head. They're, they're, they're aiming, all three synoptics are aiming for the Passion Week. They get to that moment. Jesus finally dies, and they've had 20, 30 years to think about it. They all say the same thing in the next verse. What happens when Jesus dies? The veil is torn. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that if you've had all this time to think about it, and you have all the options of atonement ready and wait, you know, waiting to go, and you're given this narrative, and you've aimed all your life to say one thing that Jesus does, why did they choose a sacred space analogy or picture? I think it's, it just works what, for me. What is the mystery then? Is is that a, was it a mystery only to Jews then? That, that Gentiles, the, the that, Gentiles, it could be full heirs of Abraham, full heirs well? without proselytization. Okay, so I, so, I think that's so new. it's the scales are on the Jews' eyes there. They're, they're, yep. That's they're the ones to whom the mystery is hidden. Okay, so that that would not, that would be a historical thing. It wouldn't be a metaphysical thing, right? If that's the case. Well, that's the beauty of it is that you can go back through. David's lineage and see a Ruth and a Rahab who got in. I love Ruth's or Rahab's statement in Joshua two eleven. Your your God Yahweh is the God of heaven and earth. And then she even says, "Would you make or will you promise me on your God's name character that you'll save me alive?" I mean, she's making this this beyond sacred space. I mean, I I think she's trampling over it. Frankly, saying I'm going to depend on the character of your deity for my well-being and the well-being of my family, whether or not I have that I have sacred space to worry about. So I, I think there's all these little moments where you see people, Daniel praying to the West without a temple. He's okay. understanding before it's actually happening that sacred space is solved because so, of the character of the God he's dealing with. Yeah, I think it's, it's it, there's a lot of interesting things that, that are running through my mind right now. I'll, one is just... Uh, 
I, I, I struggle with exactly how to explain Gentiles in the Old Testament. Not that they can't be saved if we can use modern theological verbiage, but uh, there does seem to be something that happens in the New Testament that changes their status in, in terms of the the way uh, God's people are are organized. Or Do you think like that's that. Hellenism? I don't know exactly. I mean, I think I even go back to Cornelius because you, you're talking about mm-hmm. the Cornelius story. Cornelius, when you look at how he's described in Acts 10, he's described as a God, as a Gentile yeah, who fears God a couple yeah. times, right? Yep. And he prays to God and God hears his prayers. He's not really an unbeliever. He's, not at all. He's a Gentile believer. And Peter won't and have so nothing Peter, to do with him. And Peter, I, I so, so when Peter preaches to him, this is not a conversion story. To go back to our right. cover, last conversation, it's not really a conversion story. It's an inclusion story. Exactly. Yeah, it, this, which is which is quite different <clears throat> than the way it's normally preached or taught. By the way. Yeah. Well, it, like in an unseen realm, when I go through, I have this chapter called I think it's infiltration, where you have the reclaiming of the nations start with Acts two, and it's a deliberate play, on it. It's an incomplete but a deliberate play on the on the nations of Genesis 10 that were disinherited. But then, as you keep going through Acts, all these other little places are picked off. Yeah, you yeah. know, and, and 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 the order is significant because you start out with places that are significant that are connected to Jews and their inheritance in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. You've got Samaria, uh, you've got uh, Azotus, you know, which is like a throwaway you know place. You've got Damascus. Uh, the, the, as if, as if to make the point. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's Jew first, and then we'll get to the Gentile. But all of these places that are significant to the inheritance of the seed of Abraham, the gospel goes to those places. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and then as soon as all the Jewish stuff is gobbled up, or at least you know included in the list, then you get this. You get the Cornelius episode. Yep. You get the conversion of Paul. You get all these things, and then it shifts to. You know, this Gentile territory, Paul's like, I got to get to Tarshish because that's the last thing on the list, you know, mm-hmm. the Western most point. So it's intriguing to me for those kinds of things because that's reconciliation. When we talk about sacred space, again, it's really about access to God, mm-hmm. the uh-huh. place where God is. Um, so you have the access. You've got, and then you got the church being called a temple, you know. Yeah. So, so every little village yeah. around every corner, now Paul could say to a Gentile, yeah, that's, you, that's you can approach the God of Israel through that house over there. Yeah. Go into that house and talk to those priests who are, by the way, Jesus of Nazareth and, followers. And, and yeah. I think and the one other interesting thing, I mean, it Acts, just to follow up what you were saying, Mike, you know, and then we came to Rome, Yeah. the end of Acts, which, yeah. and Rome is the center of power, the end of the universe, yeah. if you will, in mm-hmm. a sense. You know, yeah. I just think of, the old foundation series from Asimov, you know, Trantor, all roads lead to Trantor, right? Everything goes to Rome, right? It's, it's like this is the place, right? And so uh, now the whole world has been claimed in a sense, exactly. at least, ex- yeah. It, yeah. you know, in terms of the yeah, the, the geography of, except, the, except of the mind. For- Right, except for Spain, because he writes to the Romans and says, I can't wait to see you guys, but I'm only going to be there for a while. <laughs> it's, I know, but it's, it's kind of symbolically claimed in yeah. a sense, right? You know, so right. it, it's, it's, it's like if there's a capital of the, of the world, it's, it's this place. Right, yeah. so it's, it is, the, the, again, that geography stuff that we kind of pass off as kind of almost indifferent to yeah. the story. Mm-hmm. It's not indifferent because they view the world as the place that God is claiming. It's his kingdom that he's you, gradually taking. And he's turning the whole world into sacred space in a sense, exactly. right? Yeah. This is kind of a wild card, but, the, okay, the church at Rome. We, we don't know who started that. Mm. There's no indication in the New Testament who started it. We know that Aquila and Priscilla come from that because of the expulsion of Claudius. But they're, but it's, they're Jews mm-hmm. who are somehow either – either started this thing or were included in or, you know, like what's the exact relationship there. But it just seems to sort of happen independent of what's going on in Jerusalem before Paul even, you know, does his thing. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like, I mean, you, you, you could say, okay, that's a derivative of Acts 2 in some way. Like somebody goes, you know, yep. is converted, goes back, to, but, but we're not told. So you, you could have that kind of thing happening all over the world where essentially – the spirit is acting to create this set of circumstances. Well, and, and if you have a, a Pentecost, if you have these Jews from all these other places yeah. that here, and some of them go back, I mean, they seed these right. various locations with 
uh, and I would, the presence now of this inaugurated kingdom. Is and I would God recommend when you follow work. through on the sanctified by faith in him or sanctified <laughs> by faith or sanctified through Jesus, t- take that word sanctified again as a, as a sacred space, you know, momentary cleansed so or purified so that they can approach God. So it seems to be when the, like when, when the spirit comes in Acts 8 and Acts 10, and then it's, re- it's re-described in Acts 11, their point is, the Spirit came, thus showing that they're cleansed, right. and, 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 and they're cleansed by faith right. in Christ. And it's both, and right. it's interesting if, that Paul used if that the space wasn't if if their if that temple was defiled, it was it wasn't fit for occupation by the Spirit. It wouldn't the Spirit wouldn't have showed up. Exactly. And so you and you have both the corporate temple, the church. And the right. individual temple, the the believer. You got and both you can that do this language, on a Logos which, word search. Just yeah. you know, type in sanctification. Look at the Greek use of it. It's a one-time punctiliar moment in the life of the church where repeatedly someone is sanctified. And I think especially when you come to Gentile stories, it's the Spirit showing up in a visible manifestation, specifically saying, you guys are okay. Now they're already saved. They're already, I mean, they're probably already uh, yeah, well, X, see, X, yeah, X, 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 19. I, I agree. I, I agree that that's because it, it calls those people believers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's X, X 19 is a perfect example. But, yeah. but the fact that they can believe and that they do belong has to be validated. validated. So you have to have, it's a they got to send thing. Peter and John up there to check it out. Like what's going on. And, and it immediately validates what's going on here because it links it back to the yeah. X experience. As my pastor said too, I found this more humorous than the audience, but he said, People were getting saved in Acts, but then they were showing up for church, <laughs> and it was causing all sorts of trouble. And uh, I think that's exactly. Yeah, how I mean, Peter you know, I, 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 there are some modern analogs to that, by the way. I mean, you know, the the, the undesirable showing now, up to church. Again, with any, another you know. another wild card here is, um, I mean, I've I've done some reading in Second Temple sources about the veil. And there, uh, for instance, Josephus. And I, if I if memory serves me, a little bit in Philo, where they did not look at the at the veil, um, kind of the way we sort of suspect, as this. Um, what do I want to say it. Um, let, let me let me let me approach it a different way. I, I've run into some New Testament guys that will use certain things second set, said in Second Temple sources to argue that the tearing of the veil was not about access, but it was like. When you kill the Messiah, it was like the eruption of chaos. Like it, mm. it, 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 it presents this disorder out of order. So looking at it more abstractly now, even if that's the case, I don't think that that's a problem because it's not like Second Temple Jews ever thought the same way about anything. True. So you could have just this. You could have a segment over here looking at it this way, and then you could have what's going on in the New Testament be. Another mm-hmm. perspective, but it, it could even be polyvalent in the sense, right? Yeah. I mean, it could have. I mean, it could be could be viewed as doing multiple things, sure. and, and, here comes and your you're just highlighting one in the gospel. Your different so. atonement theories couldn't they all, in a sense, come back to this issue of sacred space? So you can have the Christus so Victor. He's, okay, he's trying to do the theory of everything now. Yeah, <laughs> See, this this reminds me like with Erickson's theology it says we're gonna we, there's all these interesting models out there. We're gonna squeeze them all into penal <laughs> substitution. And I just tell my students, you can judge how well he does that. I'm not so sure he's very effective, but he's trying to get the yep. one, you know. Okay, so, we're, anyway, we're Carl and I are two kaleidoscope guys. Here. <laughs> yeah, well, so. give me all the kaleidoscope images and I can get it back to <laughs> sacred space, probably. Okay, the uh, Colossians 2 wall coming down. There you go. Uh, this is, okay, the, uh, you got the triumph motif, the triumph victory over is, Satan. Is, it's a victory over Satan. Yeah, well, I guess how would that... So I don't know. I, that's... So, okay, so I'm, stumped, if, I'm, I'm stumped right now on that one, but okay, I'll have to think about right. it. And maybe you can, maybe yeah, you can do it. I'm, let, I'm let not me, saying you can't. I'm just saying I yeah. tend to be suspicious. Well, let, let, me, but... let me play <laughs> Mr. Abstraction here, and I'll, I'll help Ron. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you can do that, Mike. That's fine. Okay, Satan is the lord of the, the, lord of the earth. The, it's not just air, it's underworld, but... Unclean spirits. All right, but, but he, can, he can be said to be the lord of, of everyone because all humans die, which includes Gentiles. Okay, and so... You, you could theorize, you could postulate that since this was sort of the, the primeval enemy and, it, and it's specifically of Adam and Eve. And if you're thinking Adam and Eve being prototypical or archetypal to yeah. Israel, you could, in theory, as a Jew, be ha- getting this tunnel vision here, you know, but, but it, it's, it's really wider than, 
that a tunnel mm -hmm. vision to Adam Israel parallel. It includes all people, which is all the nations. Mm -hmm. See there? See there? I, I, I gave you a, <laughs> I gave you a lifeline, Ron. <laughs> Call him up for a lifeline. Well, like I say, this is a work in progress. So. No, I mean, I, I think it's an, a, there's some interesting things there. And for me, I'm, 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 I think I could pretty quickly make this just another aspect of my kaleidoscope, and that doesn't cause me much difficulty at all. <laughs> doesn't so, cause you much stress. <laughs> no, I mean, because yeah, because I think I just tell my students, I always say, uh, if the if if the atonement is really what we say it is, Jesus is really who we say he was. Uh, his death is is not easily mm -hmm. captured in a single limited mm -hmm. finite idea. We shouldn't yeah. be surprised that it it just overflows in surprising ways. And we can look at it from different perspectives and see elements of that that we wouldn't see otherwise. So I find that useful is, to me, but, mm -hmm. you know. Is there a, a pre-Johnson theory of the atonement that is about reconciliation, like that has reconciliation as a primary focus? <laughs> of Jew-Gentile? Not really. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, can't, I can't really think of one. Yeah, I, I can't think of one either, but. I figured if there was one, Carl, you would know it. I can't think of uh, uh, because of if there was, that just sort of sucks the air out of what he's doing. We'll we'll take all that data and throw it into our <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> Thanks, it Ron. could be, but I'm, I'm I, I can't. You know, when you go through the normal, the six or seven traditional models, yeah. it's not not the primary feature of any of them. One of the weaknesses um, of my view that I've noticed or that I have to continue to work on is the we language in Paul, where he's going to use the present or the first person plural to describe his situation pre-Christ. But I think like in Galatians, he's trying to bring in the Galatian Gentiles into that storyline so he can say we. And in Galatians 4, you know, we were under, he uses we for the uh, being under the tutelage of the powers, which I can't imagine that's Jews. I'm just saying that when you have, like hey, Romans 5, 8, let's try this out. While we Gentiles, yeah. Rome, right? While we Roman Gentiles were yet without strength, classic definition of a Gentile, Christ died for the ungodly, the non-Jew. In other words, could Romans 5, 8 through 10 even be a statement of well, Gentile if, atonement right there? If, if Paul's writing it, he hasn't, he hasn't let the Jews classify themselves as the godly versus the ungodly Gentile. But that's how they saw themselves. Oh, in other words, as they're hearing that. Right. So, well, again... If he's talking to Rome, it's getting into the hands of a majority of Gentiles, isn't it? Yeah. So as they're reading this as a Gentile, how would it sound to them that when we were yet without strength, when we were weak, literally, and that's a classic definition of a Gentile, Christ died for, why did he say ungodly? Why didn't he say all of us? I think there's a possibility he's trying to get the Gentile to see Christ's death as atoning for his lack of purification. Couldn't you just say he uses ungodly because he's just written Romans 3 that you know everyone's under condemnation, all of sin? To me, again, this is my, my little problem, but by the time you come out of the Old <laughs> we Testament... We all have problems. By the time you come out of the Old Testament, to <laughs> we me, all think they're little. you already have the set uh, placeholders for godly and ungodly, righteous and the wicked. You know, uh, Psalm 1, God knows the way of the uh, righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. That you've got these categories pre-Christ of whether you're godly or not. So could Paul use those in Romans after Romans 3 to also still claim? Well, you're you're um, not saying that an, an Old Testament Israelite would think all his fellow Israelites are righteous. Oh, no, no. But, okay. but could, you know, Ephesians 4... Um, He's talking again to, to Ephesus people who are probably Gentile. And Ephesians 4 talking about we were dead in sin, but now we are. Could, could that dead in sin be talking to the Gentile pre-atonement? That because of Christ's atonement, we are now part of that. Again, think, think visually of not getting across a divide, but walking into a temple where I get to or I have to uh, uh, account for myself to that deity in that place now because I have nothing keeping me away from it because of what Christ has done. Again, I'm presenting atonement as causing the question, not solving anything. One, one thing you might explore, I, I'm thinking like uh, the stuff Beale has done with the, with the earth and others, you know, the earth is a, becoming a temple, yeah, a theological yeah. temple and things right. like that, which again is a sacred space kind of language. 
So that would that would be some stuff that might connect with this. I'm I'm not quite sure how it fits exactly, but I'm I'm just trying to think of other things that could just follow through. This. You know, yeah, and, and follow through on the like uh, Hebrews four uh, brought to God and approach God. There's a lot of approach language that is, it keeps coming up after you see Christ is he, dying. Is he really writing to Gentiles though? I mean, I, I'm not. I wouldn't exclude in Hebrews mean. Yeah, I wouldn't exclude Gentile readers. To me, when you read Hebrews 9, where it talks about things as though, no, duh, you know, there was a thing called a temple. It had a this, it had a that. To me, if I'm a Jew, I'm saying, hello. Do do you think I don't know? Yeah, Uh, I I, I would say the audience is mixed. I I would, yeah. And well, then how about at the end where uh, 13, 12, he died outside the camp, let us go to him. It's as though it's trying to say, I know he didn't die the way a sacrifice should have died, but that's okay. To me, it's arguing or helping the Gentile feel welcome to a religion that has for centuries said you're not part of us. Um, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that. Let's go back to, before we wrap up here, yeah. let's go back to, uh, you, know, you said you, you think your view is that the atonement, I'm trying to remember how you just said it, prompted the question. Yeah. Okay, but it, it, it prompts the question, but the solution is still the, the yeah. event it's faith. Right. Well, it's it's the cross event. No. See, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick my neck out and say okay. the cross does not save people. The cross presents the question of what are you going to do with this Lord of the universe? So now the cross is the means, Philippians right. 2, to the Lordship of Jesus. So I'll never, in fact, as you read Jesus talk about going to the cross, he always includes resurrection. He never stops at, at the cross. Okay, so you're, you're right. The way people talk about the cross it tends to be the crucifixion only. Or, Right, as opposed the to the complex. whole the whole thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I mean that that's fair because you know you you got to have a resurrection before mm-hmm. you can have an ascension. You got to have the ascension to be reigning. You know, yeah, they, the whole complex is important. Well, that was my traditional reason why I got in trouble with my atonement theory was that I argued if you're going to see penal substitution as the solution, then that's tied only to that one then part. He doesn't need to resurrect. Yeah. I mean, it's nice no, that he did, but you, right. but, no, but see, you've, so- see what your you've solved the there. wrath of God on Friday night at six o'clock. And I'd argue, no, if you follow this view, it, it pushes the gen. I, 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 I get this mind or this picture in my mind of Jesus pushing a Gentile into the holy place, saying, "Okay, you got to make a decision." There's nothing stopping you. Acts ten forty five. Well, because of this, now yeah. everyone who can. But, Carl, what, to me, that's kind of catchy. You know, Jesus didn't solve the problem. You know, at, at six o'clock you know, on Friday. I mean, I, so. I, I when I when I when I talk about the work of Christ, I always talk about the fact that one of the problems with penal substitution. And again, I'm not willing to to necessarily. I'm not willing to necessarily <laughs> discard it as one of my kaleidoscope right. elements. This is why we're kaleidoscope See, guys. Kaleidoscope, we, we can just grab everything. We don't See, have that, to make any hard choices. There's your theory of everything. Right? Uh, it's that's my theory. No, 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 no. But, but, uh, but it, it certainly is true. Yeah, what's the resurrection? It, it, the penal substitution doesn't answer that. It doesn't talk about the transformative elements of the gospel, that it actually changes us into new people and empowers us to live to be live this right. kind yeah, of you, life. You it doesn't deal with, with the that. cosmic yeah. dimensions of redemption. It's not just about humans. It's about all of creation being restored. So all of those things, I, I don't think the death is it's not sufficient to explain all of those things. So we have to have a, a bigger picture of the work of Christ. So, so, you know, I, I, I try to make my, you know, I, like in my one class, one of the discussion questions is always, when's the last time you heard a sermon on the Ascension? Right. <laughs> and right. it's like, uh, I've never what's, heard a sermon no, on the Ascension. <laughs> so it's what's that? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, well, guess what? Read the, read the New Testament. That's a big yeah. part. The resurrection yeah. and Ascension are huge thing and, and so there is something that's missing there and so uh that's one reason i i'm not willing to commit just to that single model i think right. we have to have more uh, but i'm not quite will, willing to abandon it entirely it captures something i think well yeah, i mean you, some you, insight, could, you but, could certainly abandon the emphasis or the way it's talked well, about well certainly i mean yeah. not as certainly as the exclusive yeah. model i, I certainly uh, i don't yeah. do that but but i mean again if you if you have this uh, kaleidoscope or this collection of 
Well, I think uh, Scott McKnight uses the the bag of golf clubs imagery. <laughs> One, yeah, well, I think that it, just doesn't sound as good as I know. Kaleidos goes on that, but I think he, it's in his uh, book, uh, "A People Little, Called Atonement." That's right. Yeah. A People Called Atonement, I think it is. And where he talks about, yeah, we have a bag of golf clubs. So which is the which is the best golf club? He says it depends on what you're talking about doing. If you're pitching or sand in a sand trap, it's different than uh, putting on the green or driver. So he says the, all these theories have their or at least a number of these theories, not all right. theories, but mm-hmm. there there are at least a number of theories that are so grounded Ron, enough. Ron, you're letting go of the fastball, and you're <laughs> that's right. Well, Back to, to me, I would I would love to do penal substitution with sometime because to me, I've got 31 reasons why I just can't buy it. it just <laughs> okay, it, well, it, 31. That's a very just precise destroys, number. That's great. It's come down for me to where I actually am opposed to it because of theological problems. I mean, I just. I just can't do go, go there anymore. But there's there's something in Ron's childhood. Here that's <laughs> yeah, just, so yes. yeah, so that, well, that could be. But anyway, I still love you, Ron. I know. <laughs> See, if, you, if you had if you had gone to where Carl taught, it would be the beats and the couscous. Yes, you know? right. That's right. So. Well, I have this picture in my mind of my son on 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 our bed, and and he has sinned against me, and I say, "Go get Kirby. <laughs> go get Kirby. Kirby's my dog. in trouble." Yeah. In other words, if I'm satisfied by the death of not the person who did it, but someone else, what does that say about my character? We've got to talk about that. At least to me, that's a discussion point. If I can actually, I mean, does any judge do that today? If you sin and then you say, can my brother serve my sentence? And I say, hey, all I need is somebody. That says something about me, not more, you know, more than you. And I'm, and at least I want my penal substitution friends to talk about that and say, how do you come up with Old Testament? Start with that. How do you come up with a judicial system, sacrificial, you know, wherever you want to go, that allows by the time you get to the New Testament, someone to say, oh yeah, Jesus died in my place. Wait, 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 back up. Where did we come up with this whole version of a God that would be satisfied? So you're this you're way? assuming that. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say you're assuming, but um, it would seem that there's only one possible sacrifice that could accomplish all of the things that are wrapped up in resolving this problem. In other words, saying I have that view. No, no. I, I, I'm saying that is is it really? Uh, you know, again, hey, Kirby will do here. It, let's say that there's only. Let's say that Kirby was the only way, the only sacrifice that could possibly <laughs> okay. be made. To, to really restore the relationship between you and, and your son. Right. And you know, we'll throw in everybody else here. You know, <laughs> in other words, there's only one of those. So, yeah, Kirby is the only thing that's going to well, fix and, and And plus it is a little different in the sense that Kirby – in this, uh, now, if we're going to push the Kirby volunteers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kirby, you know, it is well, different. Well, Kirby, Kirby volunteers. His paw. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's all I'm asking for is a, con- is, is, is a conversation about the, pa- the actual path to get to that point. But that's another subject. So right. um, oh, I was going to say one more thing about, about Kirby. No, no, no. <laughs> about the, um, the atonement. But oh, well. See, Kurt, Kurt, we started doing the Kirby thing and he lost it. So. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, this was fun. Thanks a lot, you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Mike. Well, I feel like I just got through peeking behind the curtain to see how you theologians think out loud amongst yourselves and uh, watch it happen in real time. So that was interesting for me. Yeah. Well, it's I guess it's the way the sausage is made. I don't know. Yeah. I got to see that. But, you know, either way, it was good because we are in Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, good deal. And I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 